Today on Under the Big Tree, taking a look back at one of the greatest monosynths ever made, 1981's Sequential Circuits Pro One. Welcome back to Under the Big Tree. After a bit of a hiatus, it's great to be back, and I'd like to start by talking about one of my favorite monosynths ever, the Sequential Circuits Pro One. This synthesizer was released in 1981 and was the monosynth equivalent of the Sequential Circuits Prophet 5. The Prophet 5 was one of the most famous polyphonic synthesizers out there, and a few years later they decided to make a single sub $1,000 monosynth that was more or less the same as the single voice of the Prophet 5. The Pro One has a lot of features that are quite familiar to analog synthesizer enthusiasts. We have two oscillators, a low-pass filter, a VCA, ADSR envelopes for both the filter and the amplifier. It has an LFO and a fairly comprehensive modulation system that's really great. It also has a couple of other features, um, an arpeggiator and sequencer that are pretty neat. We will take a look at those in a little bit when we go through a rundown of the entire synth. I got my Pro One in the late 80s or the early 90s. I used it for quite a while and really enjoyed it, and then ended up putting away and not using it for a long time. When I pulled it out, I was ready to start using it again in my studio, but it had been in storage for a long time. I knew that it would need a cleaning and a recapping. As well, there were a few things about it that I never really liked. I always thought that the pots were a little scratchy and funny, and the keyboard itself was rattly and awful. Here is the original keyboard. The keys would rattle against each other. It had a very unpleasant feeling, and it was one of the reasons why I stopped using it. However, I discovered a company in Stockholm, Sweden called Tex-Mex Vintage Synth, and they had a replacement keyboard, the TM2, which was a snap-in replacement for the existing keyboard that came with the unit. I purchased a keyboard, as well as their set of knob cap replacements, which add a little bit of silver bling to the top of the knobs, and then set about refurbishing my instrument. I took the whole thing apart and started by giving it a good clean inside and out. Then I took off the wood panels and gave them a polish to make them look new. I cleaned the whole instrument, replaced the keyboard, put on the key tops, but the most important thing that I did was go through the entire board cleaning the daylights out of all of the knobs and sliders. The unit was having a lot of intermittent failures. There would be a lot of scratchiness on the knobs and on the switches. In fact, audio stopped coming out of the audio output for a while. I knew that the biggest problem was that it was really dirty. And so I went in there with deoxid and cleaned and exercised every single pot and switch over and over again until the thing sang. I then went and replaced all of the electrolytic capacitors in the power supply, which is standard operating procedure these days for all of my vintage gear. It took a few nights and some elbow grease, but by the time I was done, I plugged in and it sounded fabulous. So now, let's take a look at the whole instrument and see what it can do. So let's start with an overview of the synthesizer. It has three octaves. Uh, over here on the side it has a pitch bend wheel with a center detente and a mod wheel. Then up here, all of the different sections of the synthesizer are broken out in blocks with these oval white lines around them to make it easy to see what's going on. It starts over here with a modulation section which allows us to be able to route uh, different devices like the wheels to different parameters of the instrument. Then here we have our first oscillator, oscillator A, and here is oscillator B. Then below that, here is our LFO. Then there's a sequencer with a couple of short sequences that you can record and play back, as well as an arpeggiator. Moving up here, we now have the mixer that allows us to be able to mix the two oscillators, as well as a white noise, which can also be an external audio input. Then here is the glide section, so this allows us to be able to use portamento on the monophonic synthesizer. Then there's a mode section that allows us to trigger notes in different ways. Moving up here to the end, we have a low pass filter. Then we have the envelope for the low pass filter. It has its own ADSR envelope. 
Then we have the ADSR envelope for the amplifier itself. And then finally on the end, we have a master tune knob and the master volume knob. Okay, let's start with the oscillators. The Pro One has two oscillators, oscillator A and oscillator B, and they're similar, but not exactly the same. So let's start with oscillator A. There it is running in one of its two wave shapes. This is the pulse wave shape. It also has a sawtooth wave shape. Frequency range on the oscillator is an octave and a minor third. So you can use that to do quite a bit of interesting tuning between the two oscillators. Now it actually has, of course, a four octave range. There's the bottom. So that's as low as the oscillator goes. Up one octave up another octave, and up the top octave. As I said, there are two wave shapes, the sawtooth and the pulse. Now the pulse allows you to be able to change the pulse width. Which is always a very cool sound. You can also modulate that so you don't have to just do it by, by turning the knob. You can also Turn both oscillators on at the same time, so you can have a, a wave shape that is a combination of the pulse and the sawtooth, which is really neat. So you get three different types of wave shapes between each oscillator. Now, right now the oscillator is synced to itself in terms of frequency. If we turn on sync, it's changing. But the reason is because it is now synchronized to the frequency of oscillator B. So let's turn it off. Turn on oscillator B, you can hear that those are two different notes. And then as soon as I hit sync, they sync right up. So let's move on to oscillator B. As you can hear, it sounds identical to oscillator A. It has the same frequency tuning range. same four octave range, and it still has the sawtooth and the pulse wave shapes with the pulse width. However, it also has a triangle wave shape, which is wonderful. Um, I'm sure that's derived from the sawtooth by filtering it, but it's just a great sound. I really like that sound a lot. So we've got our buzzy sawtooth, our very mellow triangle wave, and our pulse wave that we can move back and forth. Oscillator B does a couple of things that oscillator A does not. The first thing is that you can turn it into a low frequency oscillator. So by hitting that button and getting all the way down here, we're all the way down into sub audio territory. You can hear it just generating clicks. So it's good for uh, doing sub-audio stuff along with oscillator A. The other thing uh, that you can do with it is you can turn off the keyboard access. So now the keyboard has no control over the pitch of oscillator B, only its own internal frequency. And so what that means is you can use it with oscillator A. Where oscillator B can act as a pedal note or a drone. Okay, let's take a look at the LFO clock module. This is another example of really awesome brevity in design and very elegant engineering. In a minute, we'll get into how it modulates things, but for right now, let's just look at the LFO itself. So, it has three different wave shapes, a sawtooth, a triangle, and a pulse. 
like the other modules, you can add these wave shapes together and get more complicated waveforms. And the frequency knob over here goes from up into the bottom of audio range down to a really beautifully slow LFO. and we turn off the LFO. Now, in addition to being the LFO, this is also the clock module. So the frequency knob controls how, frequen how frequently the pulses are coming out that drive the sequencer, that trigger the arpeggiator, and that trigger this repeat mode that we'll get into in a second. So let's uh, turn on the sequencer. And there it is, just playing a downward chromatic scale. Okay, now let's take a look at the sequencer. Once again, it's marvelous in its simplicity and ability to be able to allow you to create quick sequences right on the fly. There is a grand total of 40 notes, huge amount of RAM in this thing, I know, that you can split up between the two sequences, sequence one and sequence two. And sequencing could not be easier. All we do is start by switching it to record mode then we determine which sequence we want to record to. We're going to record sequence one. And then we go and play our little sequence. Hit off and go to play and then turn it back on. Very simple. Turn it off, then we can go and start recording the other sequence if we want. In this case, we can just listen back to it. We still have that chromatic scale going down. One other thing that you can do with the sequencer that's really neat is you can record rests. So it would be awfully boring if you can only record one note after another. But it gives you a very simple way to be able to record rests as well, and this is how you do it. So we Set up for record, go into sequence one mode, record our sequence, and then switch to play, which creates a rest, and then back to record. Rest. And then we go back and listen. The sequencer has one more really awesome trick up its sleeve, which is this. When you are playing the sequence back, you can modulate it by playing different keys on the keyboard. Okay, now let's take a look at the arpeggiator. Again, extremely simple, very easy to use. Defaults to the off position. Of course, it's a monophonic synth, so it's only playing a single note. But if we turn it on to up, and we play a chord, 
you'll hear that it's arpeggiating upwards. Now, one thing that's very important in the arpeggiation mode is that we have the, this, the, the playback mode over here set to re-trigger. If we set it to normal, and then we played back a chord like that, it would just play through once and then go to the sustain portion of the chord. Right, if we turn the sustain all the way off, then we don't hear anything. But if we switch it over to re-trigger mode, then every new note that's being triggered on the arpeggiator is re-triggering the ADSR envelope. And then, of course, we can switch it to up and down. Tons of fun, and again, just so easy, but so musical. Okay, let's take a look now at the playback mode section here. This part seems maybe a little quizzical, but it's not that hard to understand once you start uh, getting involved in it. So the first thing we have is, on this side, are we playing back a drone, or are we playing back whatever you're doing on the keyboard? Well, if you play, play in drone mode, it just starts playing whatever you've got going on in the synthesizer. But what it's playing is the sustain portion of the envelope. So if you turn the sustain portion off, then you're not going to hear anything, which can be a little confusing. But assuming that it's in the S portion of the ADSR envelope, when you're in drone mode, it just sits there and you can play around with everything else. If you don't have that on and you're in normal mode here, then as you play, it triggers the amplifier where every new note will trigger unless you're playing with a bunch of notes down or in legato mode, okay? Um, that's normal. Up here, we switch this to repeat slash external. And now, it's just triggering away at the rate set by the clock. Unless you have a gate signal plugged into the gate input in the back. So if you use this thing with a modular synthesizer, for example, you could actually trigger the synthesizer from a modular synthesizer, which is pretty great. And then finally, over here, we have the re-trigger mode that I talked about earlier, where if we turn on the arpeggiator, if we turn it to normal, it's just going to the sustain port, it's just playing back at the sustain portion without hearing the attack decay with every re-trigger. But if we turn on re-trigger, then it is re-triggering the envelope every time that it triggers another note within the arpeggiator. All right, let's take a look at the mixer module. It is dead simple. There are three different knobs. One for oscillator A, one for oscillator B, and one for the white noise generator, which we have not listened to up to this point. So, like many of these synths, there's a little white noise thing, so you can use it for percussion or being able to add a little grit to your sound or whatever you want. Um, that also is overridden by the external audio input. So if you take an outside world signal and plug it into the audio input, then this knob becomes the mixer signal for that instead. Dead simple. Okay, now let's take a look at the glide function here. Glide's also called portamento, um, and what it refers to is how long it takes to go between notes. So here's the glide rate if it's all the way down. As I play an octave there, it just goes back and forth with no notes in between, but watch this. As you bring the glide level up, it creates a glissando in between the notes that's very idiomatic of 70s progressive rock sounds. Now, um, 
one of the things that's really cool about Glide on the Pro One that uh, takes a little bit of getting used to is this auto mode. So when we switch it, so in normal mode, every note glides from one to the other. If we switch to auto mode, if we play, if we play legato, so the note is still down while I play the next note, it glides between them. But if I play in a detached style, there's no glide at all, so... So interesting. It takes a little bit of, of practice to be able to get the performance idea down, but it's really neat because it allows you to be able to play uh, notes quickly. And then also play it with a little bit more glissando in between if you're holding the notes down. Okay, now it's time to talk about the filter. The Pro One uh, has a single low pass filter. There's no high pass or band pass. Uh, it's just this one filter, but it sounds really pretty great. So uh, let's take a look at what it can do. So here is our sawtooth wave. And let's just slowly bring down the filter with no resonance. And then back up. add some resonance in and you can hear how that at the filter cutoff frequency you can hear that very characteristic analog low pass filter sound with a high resonance let's bring it all the way up Have the resonance all the way up, it self oscillates. And as we turn off the oscillators, now we get an oscillating sound, an oscillating sine wave from the resonance, resonance and the pitch changes based on our cutoff. Okay, now let's talk about uh, a couple of other functions here. The envelope amount, the, the low pass filter comes with its own built in ADSR envelope. So that's incredibly useful. We can play the sound right now with the cutoff very low, you're not hearing much. But if we add the envelope to it, then that's adding to the cutoff frequency. And now we're getting some of that very characteristic analog filter sweep type of thing. Let's add a little resonance. such a great sound. The next thing for us to look at here is the keyboard amount. And what that has to do with is the range of the key having to do with the brightness of the filter. So if we have the keyboard amount all the way down, then it doesn't matter where you play on the keyboard, the filter cutoff is the same. However, if we start bringing it up, then low notes, are duller than high notes, which is kind of the way that a lot of instruments actually react in nature. <laughs> 
how it's opening and closing, depending upon where we are on the keyboard. Okay, now let's take a look at the VCA, at the volume amplifier, which is this down here. It is another attack, decay, sustain, release envelope, and uh, it is very tight and plucky when the attack and decay are closed down. I mean, you can really just get a small little click and then... You can get quite a bit more. I'm just using the white noise. Bring up a little release. And boom, you've got yourself a hi-hat sound. And of course, you can bring up the attack, bring down the decay, and get sort of a backward sucking sound here. Okay, now let's play with the sustain a little bit. So if we have the sustain down, you can still really hear the attack and the decay, but the note can stick and stay because of the sustain. And with the release, of course, it continues to play after you take your finger off the note. We can, there we go. We can play around with the attack and the decay to get so many different kinds of sounds. And then if we add to that the filter envelope, you can get all sorts of interesting sounds combining those two envelopes. Okay, the last thing to go over on the front panel of the Pro One is this modulation matrix. Now, this takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you figure it out, it's really pretty cool. So what is a modulation matrix? A matrix is something where you take inputs, or you have these sounds or some sort of control signals on one side, and then you run them into parameters on the other side. So, in this case, we have three possible sources. We have LFO amount, we have oscillator B frequency, and then we have the filter envelope, okay? Um, each of these have a, have a knob to tell you how much or how strongly you want this input to affect the output, okay? But there's one more part, and this is the part that's a little tricky that get takes getting used to. Each of these can either be assigned to the modulation wheel, in which case moving the modulation wheel up and down controls the amount that it goes to the output, or just what they call direct, or just an a, a automatic control from here directly to whatever it is that we, that we are controlling. So we've got the input side of it here where we have these three sources, each of which can be controlling things either directly or by using the mod wheel one or the other. Then over here, we have the five parameters that these things can actually control. So we have oscillator A frequency, oscillator A pulse width, oscillator B frequency, oscillator B pulse width, and the filter cutoff. So here is where it's a little confusing. What you do is you determine with each of these whether it can be modulated, if it can't be modulated, it's in the off position. If it can be modulated, then you can set it to be either modulated by wheel or modulated directly. And what happens then is whichever of, let's say that I take this oscillator A frequency and I set it to direct, then whichever of these parameters are set to go direct 
will will control it and will will work that way. So you could have oscillator B and the LFO both controlling oscillator A frequency if they're both set to direct. If these are set to wheel, then the only thing that would that would modulate oscillator A frequency at direct is this LFO that we set to direct. So let's have a listen. So there's our oscillator A. And as we turn up the amount, the LFO is being routed directly to oscillator A frequency. And the farther up we make this go, the more strongly or the wider the pitch excursion happens as a result of that LFO. Just add a little bit of vibrato. If we want something that's really subtle like that. Now, let's take this and switch LFO to wheel and it immediately turns off. We're not hearing it anymore because oscillator A frequency is still trying to get something from direct. But if we switch that to wheel, and this is set to wheel, now if we move the modulation wheel, now oscillator A is getting that LFO because of the fact that we are turning the modulation wheel up. Okay. So let's take a look at a couple of other interesting things that we can do here. Let's control, we can get a little bit of FM sound by controlling oscillator A with oscillator B. So I'm going to set oscillator B to wheel, set oscillator A to reading from the wheel. Turned off the LFO, so now all we're hearing is the FM sound that we're getting from frequency modulating oscillator A with oscillator B. So this is great for sound effects of all sorts. We can also do the same thing with pulse width. Let's go and modulate the oscillator A pulse width with oscillator B. And of course, another classic sound that we can get through this modulation is modulating the filter cutoff frequency with the LFO. So let's take a look at our LFO. We have it set to direct. We have our filter receiving things on the direct channel. And then let's bring up the LFO amount. So much you can do with the synthesizer, you can just explore it forever. Okay, and finally, let's take a look at the back of the Pro One to see how beautifully this thing would interface with any other analog uh, synthesizers, including modular ones now. Starting out, we have an audio output, which is just what you think, an unbalanced quarter inch tip sleeve output. It also has an audio input, as we saw that you can route in from the mixer and you can run it through the filter and you can apply uh, modulation to it and so forth. Then there is a filter control voltage in to allow you to modulate the filter cutoff frequency from an external voltage. Then here are outputs. Here is where as you play a note on the Pro One, it'll send out a gate signal and a control voltage output signal, including the sequencer information, if you have the sequencer running. Finally, over here, 
there is a gate clock in, which you can use to be able to trigger the synthesizer. And the clock, if it's getting a pulse coming in here, it will override uh, what's coming out of the uh, LFO clock module. And then finally, there's a control voltage in to allow you to uh, modulate the pitch of the instrument externally from an external CV instead of from the keyboard itself. So that is the Sequential Circuits Pro 1 from 1981, a completely awesome monosynth that I think hits a really beautiful sweet spot of features that are combined with incredible ease of use and intuition. It's one of these instruments in which you can get so many sounds out of it, it just takes a little bit of elbow grease, a little bit of creativity, and a little bit of time twiddling these knobs. But what a fun thing to do. So that's it for this episode of Under the Big Tree. It is good to be back and talking about synthesizers again. If you like what we're doing here on Under the Big Tree, please feel free to like, share, and subscribe. And for now, this is Nick, signing off. <laughs>